Morning. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Brother Faye. And praise God for baptism and the testimony that that is. And I'm encouraged and excited to see uh, more uh, brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ become baptized. Um, it's a blessing. So first of all, good morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. As we've been saying, Christ is everything. We are here today to worship in God in spirit and in truth. We are here today to bring acceptable worship unto our most holy God. We are here today to lift high the word of God and to humble ourselves under his mighty hand. We are here today to hear from God through his word. Please turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. As you turn there, I want to give a few uh, words of context. I've titled this sermon, Spiritual Realities of a True Church. And if you remember, it sounds very familiar with the title I gave our first sermon in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and that was Spiritual Dynamics of a True Church. So from 2 Thessalonians 1, we saw God is the author of our faith. He is the founder of our faith. He justifies us. He sanctifies us. He glorifies us. Everything about us, everything we do, everything that happens to us is because of God's sovereign, righteous, and just will for us. And as I go through children's catechism with Gabriel, one of the first questions he has to answer is, why did God make you? The answer is not to live our best life now. The answer is not to get what we want. The answer is not to be a successful businessman or a pro athlete or have money, friends, or fame. The answer is simply for God's glory. Our whole lives are to glorify God. And apart from God, we can't do that. Apart from God, we are dead. Apart from God, we are in darkness. Apart from God, we are children of wrath. Without God, we are nothing. However, in that state that we are in, Ephesians 2, 4 through 9 reminds us, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. We were nothing but God. We were evil but God. We were lost but God. We were sinners but God. We saw this in chapter 1. We saw this, uh, that God grows our faith. We saw that God increases our love. And we saw that God enables us to persevere patiently. These are the spiritual dynamics that, we, that are evident in a true church. From there, the rest of the chapter, chapter 1, warns of God's righteous judgment on those who, in verse 8, do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These people were not growing in their faith, love, and perseverance. It's simply the contrast of life in God versus life without God. Then we saw in Thessalonians chapter 2, shaken, they, were, they were shaken by false, a false letter claiming to be from Paul. Paul corrects an er, the errors and reminds them of some important eschatological truths to realign their thinking according to the rest of Scripture. In doing so, he commands them to stand firm. False teachers, false letters, false believers will try to infiltrate the church and dilute the purity of the church. However, Paul says in verse 15 of chapter 2, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. This pattern Paul lays out can be exemplified all throughout church history. God continues to work. Satan continues to hinder that work. The church stands firm on the word of God and fights the good fight. And, the church, and as the church stand, stands, firm, stands firm, excuse me, it will bear fruit that will be evident in a true church. That's the reality. And when these fruits are evident, Satan cannot overcome them. And this is what we look at today. So please stand with me in reverence as our God speaks to us through this word. As we read together, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. 
and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Let's pray. You may be seated. Heavenly gracious Father, Lord of heavens and the earth, author of our faith, as we saw in baptism just now, Lord, you are working in our lives. You are doing the work, and we praise you for that. I pray you open our hearts and minds through your Holy Spirit within us to understand your word today, to hear from you and apply these truths to our lives. Lord, thank you for using this church at Braddock. I pray that you bless everyone here, whatever anyone is going through right now, Lord, that you comfort and encourage them. We love you and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, there are four spiritual realities that will be evident in a true church when God is at work and the church is standing firm on the word of God. This ultimately will strengthen and protect the church from evil. So the first reality is a prayerful church. A prayerful church. Look at verse 1 through 2. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you, and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. Paul, a giant in the faith, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, asked the Thessalonian church to pray for him. Remember, this church was a young church. This church was a baby church. It just started. And Paul, being an apostle, asked baby Christians to pray for him. This again shows Paul's humility and reliance upon prayer. He is not outside of the need for God's protection. He was not outside and still needs prayer. And he still needs prayer warriors to lift him up. This shows that prayer works. This shows that prayer is an essential reality of a believer no matter the maturity level of that believer. The earliest Christian in, the, in that church to the newest Christian in that church were called to pray for Paul. Here, though, Paul is not asking them to pray for a fancy car, a private jet, or a better job. He asked them to pray for two things, and that is the word will progress and that God's protection will be on him against evil men. So in verse 1, he says, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. As Paul often compares the Christian life to that of a race, here he is using that same imagery, only with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church needs to pray for the continuation, the progress, the rapid spreading of the gospel. As we saw back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul's greatest concern is for the gospel to advance. The church must pray for the gospel spreading, gospel advancement, and the gospel of progress. But not only for that, but that it is glorified. The Greek word for glorified literally means to ascribe weight by recognizing real substance. We see the same word used in Luke 5, 25-26 when Jesus heals the paralytic who was let down from the roof. Look at his response. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. He knew that Jesus was God. What Paul is simply saying is that as the gospel would move rapidly, by, by God's grace and election, people would believe and trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as people believe and trust in the gospel, the church is formed. This is remarkable and should bring glory to God. And he, and, and he then says, Paul says, just as it did also with you, the Thessalonians were the object lesson of this teaching. God is already answering their prayers. The gospel is already moving, saving, and being glorified. And the second thing Paul asks for prayer is, in verse 2, in that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. He then asks for safety, those who would take, for those who would take the gospel forward. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 26, give us a little, a little glimpse into what Paul could be referring to at the hands of men. Five times I received from the Jews, 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. 
I have been on frequent journeys, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers among false brothers. Paul clearly needs prayer. But in our text, Paul says, not all have faith. Of course, perverse and evil men do not have faith. So why would he say that? Perverse in the Greek means out of place or strange. And evil men can mean bad, wicked, malicious, or slothful. Yes, I think he is referring to the general wicked humanity. But I do believe he adds this phrase, for not all have faith, to warn the Thessalonians of perverse and evil men inside the church as well. We see that in the verse I quoted before in 2 Corinthians 11:26, 26, dangers from, from false brothers. We see John the Apostle write the same thing in 3 John 1, 9. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not welcome what, he, what we say. We see Jesus is teaching the same thing in Matthew 7, 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Clearly, Paul had his fair share of dangers outside the church. But as we just read, he had his fair share of those in the church. Prayer is so important for Paul. He needs to be rescued from evil men as he advances the gospel. This is the first reality of a true church. One that prays for its pastors. One that prays for the gospel. One that prays for protection against perverse and evil men, both outside the church and within the church. So today, do you pray? Do you pray continuously? Do you pray continuously for your pastors and your elders? That God would continue the work we devote our lives to every day. We need the prayer, that's for sure. And we need prayer that God will indeed protect us as we uphold God's word and God's truth in this culture and generation. I humbly ask all of you to pray for us. If Paul is in need of prayer for his, from his people, how much more do we need prayer from you? Colossians 4.2, Paul commands, devote yourselves to prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. A true church is one that God continues to work in, and the first reality of God's working is a prayerful church. Secondly, the second reality is a confident church. A confident church. Look at verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. The Lord is faithful. I want to point out here that in the original Greek again, when Paul penned this letter, they didn't use chapter breaks, punctuation, or capitalization like we do in English. Paul deliberately writes a contrast between the last verse and this verse. In the Greek, if we were to translate it literally, Paul wrote, Not for all are of the faith. Faithful, however, is the Lord. No doubt Paul was using wordplay to emphasize the vast difference between the lack of faith of perverse and evil men and the faithfulness of Christ. And if you notice, Paul changes the object of the sentence as well, from us, Paul and and Timothy and Silas, to you. What can be concluded then is that Paul indeed wanted prayer for himself and the other apostles, but at the same time, the prayer should be for the Thessalonian church as well. Because they will experience the same thing Paul and the apostles will face. The true church will advance the gospel. The true church will need protection from perverse and evil men. And with with that change of object comes Paul's encouragement to the church to trust in Christ. Paul is saying, pray that the gospel will, will advance, but know the Lord is faithful. Pray that God will protect you from perverse evil men, but know the Lord is faithful. Not all men have faith, but know the Lord is faithful. And Paul writes two ways here that the Lord is faithful when advancing the gospel and when we stand before evil men. The Lord will strengthen and the Lord will guard. Not just from perverse and evil men, but the Lord will protect the church from the evil one, Satan himself. This is such an encouragement. And one that the true church can trust in. The Thessalonians need to trust that not only will God protect the apostles, but he will protect their church as well. He will strengthen within and protect us outwardly. So today, having the complete canon of Scripture, we can see a little deeper into how Christ strengthens and guards his church. This by no means is an exhaustive list. He strengthens us through the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 3.14 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, 
from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that he would give you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in the inner man. Christ also strengthens us through preaching of God's word. Paul says in, the, in, in this way in Romans 16, 25 through 27, Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit who strengthens you. You are strengthened by the gospel, the preaching, and the reading of God's word. And because you have the Spirit, because you listen to the word preached, God strengthens you as he works in you to grow in the knowledge of him and works in you to be obedient to him. Colossians 1, 9 through 11. For this reason also, since the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you that, and to ask that you may be filled with the full knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and multiplying the full knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Christ is faithful. He strengthens us through the Spirit within us, through the preaching of God's Word, and through growing in the full knowledge of God and bearing fruit in every good work. All of this, as you can see, comes from God. All this comes from His working within us. All this is for His glory alone. He strengthens us within. He is faithful. He also guards us outwardly. How? I'll give you two ways, and again, this is not exhaustive. One way is to put the whole armor of God on. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the full armor of God so you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And by the way, each one of these pieces of armor has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with Christ. Put on truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace. Take up faith, and receive salvation and the word of God. Another way, through God, another way God protects us and guards us is through God-ordained, qualified and faithful elders. Acts 20, 28 through 30 says, Be on guard, and this is Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Christ is faithful. A true church will pray. A true church will have confidence in Christ, will trust in Christ. And third, another reality is an obedient church. An obedient church. Look at verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. This verse sounds familiar. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul writes, I ought always to give thanks to God for you. Remember, God was the one working in and through us. God is the one to be thanked for spiritual, a spiritually dynamic church. And here, Paul is blaming God yet again for the fruits of this church. Paul has confidence in the Lord for what the church is doing. Not for the church's ability, but he has confidence that the Lord is the one who does the work among them. And the Lord will continue to do the work among them. This is the reason why an obedient church is evidence of a true church. If they are obedient to Paul's commands, which are ultimately the Lord's commands, only one person gets the glory for that, and that's the Lord. And notice, Paul is confident in the Lord because they were currently doing what he commands. However, he doesn't hope that they will continue. He doesn't wish that they would continue. He doesn't even pray that they will continue. He has confidence in the Lord that they will continue. Why? Because it's not produced in them. It is produced by God. And as we keep being reminded by Paul's similar words to the Philippian church, he says in Philippians 2, 12-13, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God. It is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
This verse is to encourage the Thessalonians to keep doing what they're doing. They're doing it right. They're doing it for God's glory. Their faith is growing. Their love is growing. Their perseverance is growing. But here's the encouragement. Paul doesn't put that high expectation on their shoulders. His confidence is in the Lord. The Lord will do the work. The Lord will enable. The Lord will answer their prayers. The Lord will strengthen and guard them. The Lord will do it. It is a spiritual reality of a true church. And one that is most comforting. Today, however, it is not so easy to know if a church is true or false. It seems that you have to go church hopping for months until you find a true church. Let me give you a hint. One easy way to tell if a true church, if a, if a church is true or false, is this. Are they obedient to the word? If they say they are true, yet have a woman pastor or an LGBTQ pastor or staff, are they obedient to the word? If they say they are true, yet you rely on experience and entertainment over the preaching of God's word, are they, are they being obedient? If they say they are true but preach a false gospel, are they being obedient? If they say they are true but everything is about you, are they being obedient? Beloved, test the spirits to see if they are from God. A true church is one that is obedient to the word of God, not based on their own work or ability, but on God's work and God's ability. 1 John 2, 3 through 6 says, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. The true church is a prayerful church, a confident church, and an obedient church. And lastly, the fourth reality is a directed church. A directed church. Look at verse 5. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. As the Thessalonians pray for the advancement of the gospel and the protection from perverse and evil men, if they are confident in their faithful Lord and Savior, if they are obedient through the Holy Spirit within them, this fourth reality will always be true. They will indeed be a directed church. church excuse me, Not directed by the world. Not directed by the, sm the smartest man in the room. Not directed by human reason. And definitely not directed by the current culture. The church is directed by Christ himself who is the head of the church. As Colossians 1.18 says, and he is the head of the body of the church. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23 states, And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fits all in all. Only Christ can direct the church. Only Christ can be the head of the church. No pope, no pastor, no elders, no committee, no deacons, no board, no one. Christ is the head of the of the church. And when Christ is the head, only then can a true church be directed by Christ and be steadfast in Christ. Paul here is saying Christ will direct and make straight their path. The inner man will be led by the Holy Spirit forward. Through sanctification, a true church cannot be stationary. It cannot be drifting. It is directed and it is guided. Where does Paul say here that the Thessalonians are being directed to? He says, into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. How Paul, writes into, how Paul writes into the love of God is somewhat broad. It can mean here God's love for them, but also their love for God. Either way, it is the Lord, Jesus Christ, that directs their hearts into the love of God or into their love for God. This love, agape love, is a spiritual reality of the true church. As John, 1 John 4, 16 through 17 says, And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has in us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love has been perfected with us, 
so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. Paul then writes, the Lord will direct your hearts into the steadfastness of Christ. Again, this can be referring to Christ's steadfastness or our steadfastness. Both will be reality. Either way, it is the Lord that directs our hearts into, the reali- into realizing Christ's steadfastness, Christ's perseverance, Christ's patience, and it is the Lord that also directs our hearts to have steadfastness, to have perseverance, and to have patience. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 relates both of these so beautifully. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, laying aside every weight and sin which so easily entangles us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary, fainting in heart. Jesus Christ, the head of the church, directs the heart of his church to love God with all their heart, all their mind, soul, strength, and to know God's love. And he directs our hearts to the, of the church to be steadfast, to persevere, and to be patient through everything and anything this life has to come at us as we stand upon his word. Today, when things are, aren't right in life, when things get us down, when things hurt us, when people persecute or malign you, when you're at the end of yourself and don't know what to do, what are the two most difficult things to do? It's difficult to love others, and it's very difficult to persevere through them. The first thing we want to do is distance ourselves from others and from God. The first thing we want to do, or the second thing we want to do, is give up or retreat. It's too hard. Nothing's changing. But remember, the Lord is faithful. And the Lord will direct you into love and into steadfastness. Whatever you may be going through, as long as it's not because of sin or is sin, let me encourage you, don't give up the fight. Don't give up the stand. Don't give up based on what you see. Trust our faithful Lord and Savior. He will pull through. And while you do that, don't forget, God loves you. God loves you. Guys, they're fighting for you. God will use it for your good. God will grow and chisel you into who he wants you to be. Because of God's love, because of Jesus' victory over all, and because you have the Holy Spirit within you, you can love through it all. You may be familiar with this verse, but it sure is a blessed reminder. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcame the world. In closing, first to the believer in this room, Please pray for your pastors and elders. We need it. Pray that God use our church, each one of us, to spread the gospel. Pray that God protects all of us in the face of persecution, adversity, and trials. But as you pray that, remember, Christ, again, is faithful. He will strengthen and guard us. He does the work. He is to be praised. And as we read last week in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you as the first fruits of salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in truth. You were chosen by God. Because God chose you in Him before the foundation of the world, you can be confident in Him. You can be obedient to Him. and You can be directed by Him. These are the realities of a true church. To God be the glory forever. So let's strive through the Holy Spirit to be a true church. 1 Timothy 3.15. One of my favorite passages in scripture when it comes to the church of the living God. I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support 
of the truth. If you are not a believer in Christ, we've talked a lot today about realities that will be in a believer's life. Prayer, confidence, obedience, direction. Maybe prayer doesn't sound very interesting because it means you are dependent on someone other than yourself. Maybe obedience doesn't interest you because you want to live how you want to live. But I think everyone wants strength. Everyone wants protection. Everyone wants direction in their life. And I think everyone wants to be able to stand firm in the face of adversity or persecution. And I think everyone knows that there is a God. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, both His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what He has made, so that they are without excuse. The question is, are you going to put your faith and trust in the one true God? There's only one way to do that. And there's two sides of that same coin. The first one is to repent, which means to recognize that you are a sinner. Recognize that you are in danger. Recognize that you cannot do it on your own. Recognize that you deserve eternal punishment from a perfect and just God. Repent of your sins so that you, that you committed and will commit. And that you need a Savior. If you're living and breathing right now, you still have time. God is patient with you. As 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some consider slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In Acts 17.30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now commanding men that everyone, everywhere, should repent. When you come to repentance, when you come to the grips that you are nothing, but God is everything, when you see yourself for how God sees you, a sinner in need of a Savior, then the flip side of the same coin is this. Believe in Jesus Christ. Trust in Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you will obtain the forgiveness of sins leading to eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 through 12 says, and the witness is this, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I testify to you today, just as Paul did in Acts 12, 20, verse 21, about repentance towards God and the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe today. To all, I want to leave Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 through 21. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, our Lord Jesus, equip you in every good thing to do His will, by doing in us what is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your promises today. Thank you that you do the work within us. Thank you that we don't have to muster up all this strength and ability when things don't go our way. And in the midst of adversity, in the midst of everything that this world has to offer, it's not on our strength. We are so weak, Lord. We are so weak. How can you expect us to handle anything? And I praise you for not expecting us to handle everything. You do the work within us. And I praise you and glorify you for doing that. Whoever needs that comfort, whoever needs that extra uh, strength that comes from you, Lord, I pray you make it evident to them that you are working in them and through them. Please forgive us of our sins. Please forgive us of the sins of this church. Please forgive my personal sins, Lord. And help us to be a true church. One that glorifies you. One that shows to the world that you are real and you are working. You are so incredible, God. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's continue in worship. Let's all stand up.